Life hinges on moments. For me, one of those moments was in late 1999. This is wrestling's backwater, the independent circuit where most wrestlers will spend their careers. Seen all over the world on ABC 2020, I'd achieved the first step of my childhood dream to become a professional wrestler. For Nigel, this moment's been a year in the making. Within months, however, my visa ran out and I had to return to England. A decade later, in the summer of 2009, I'd become one of the most critically acclaimed professional wrestlers in the world and had finally signed a contract with World Wrestling Entertainment, the largest and most successful company in the history of professional wrestling. Months later, however, they rescinded the contract for an old arm injury, leaving me the only option of signing with Total Nonstop Action, TNA for short, professional wrestling's secondary company. Fast forward to the following summer, and in the middle of a program for the tag team titles, I was pulled from the pay-per-view at the last moment, after testing positive for hepatitis B while working there. Less than a year after that, having barely been used or paid again, I was fired from the company. With my career in TNA over, and WWE not interested, all I had was the grocery store job I'd had to get when TNA had stopped using me. A few years earlier I'd actually been in the movie The Wrestler. Now it felt like I was the real thing. These then were pivotal moments in my life. But was I destined to be defined by them? Or would it be my reaction to them that ultimately would determine how I'd be remembered? It was with that thought in my head, coupled with the burden of having to carry the secrets of what happened in WWE and TNA, that having cleared the virus and being cleared to wrestle, I decided to go on one final tour, back to the small shows where I'd started. It would be the last chance to say goodbye, the last chance for a resolution. The last of McGuinness. It's about six thirty in the morning, the day before the tour starts. I'm not sure I ever had a specific, specific idea of what being a wrestler was going to look like. I guess it was always wrestling for WWE, traveling around the world and making the sort of money I could retire on, you know? And this, this hasn't been it. And I know that. And I know that the arguably never will be. Many years of my life pursuing this, my whole entire adult life, no, it didn't pay off, I mean that's the truth. I guess I always did see myself ending up in WWE. Being one of the guys that people talk about, like, oh, if you never give up and you know, all this sort of stuff. I know, I've heard it all before, fucking it's all perspective, it's all perspective, yeah, yeah, yeah. Fuck perspective. I've got some perspective for you. 20 years of fucking pursuing this dream and fucking sacrificing everything I possibly fucking could. I know we did not pay off, but I'm fucked. Cut my fucking arm as well. That's great. Perfect. You know me and blood. I guess what I'm trying to say is that. I grew up in a small village in the southeast of England, and when I was about 14 years old, I had a dream. Probably not unlike a lot of kids that age. Like, do you remember we, we body slammed each other like a hundred yeah, times? Yeah, exactly. But, unlike a lot of kids that age, I guess I never really did grow up. I travelled around the world. People would say, why is the man behind the bar? And we would say, because he wants to be a wrestler. Really? And they would say, what's that got to do with wrestling? We'd say, absolutely nothing. But <laughs> if you want to be a wrestler, you've got to be a bit special. I went to university. All your mates on the walls had the posters of the girls and you had the British Bulldog. <laughs> but at the end of it, the only thing I ever wanted to do, still, was be a professional wrestler. 
I felt like it was my destiny. And so, I found a pamphlet in the back of a wrestling magazine and wrote off to every wrestling school in it. Months later, I bought a ticket and went to America to finally pursue the only dream I ever had. But I know you were shaken. You were like so excited to be in a wrestling ring. You were so hungry, not only for food, but for knowledge. No muscles, straight up and down like a board. <laughs> As scripted, Nigel lands his super kick. A year later, when my first match was featured on ABC 2020, I was hooked. To really be able to make the crowd scream at you or boo you without them even realizing that you're getting them to do it. It's magic. It's magic. It's a job, man. You strive for something so long, you know, and you think, if I never make it, it'll be a tragedy. <laughs> Maybe that's the beauty of it, that I'm still chasing it. And I will always be chasing it. That was how the piece ended. And as you know, it could have been the end of my story. But it wasn't. You were dedicated. You wanted it more than anything. And you were so upset, I remember, when you, you had to go back. Back in England, I slept on a friend's kitchen floor for over a year and saved up enough money to come back and pursue the dream again. I started back in Cincinnati. Before too long, began traveling the back roads of Midwest America, paying my dues, cutting my teeth. I began wrestling for Ring of Honor, a highly regarded independent company. And it was here I made a name for myself. For the Tower of London here learning the art form and paying considerable physical price for doing so. I know you don't believe wrestling's an art form. Let me show you why. Just looks like two guys beating each other up, right? Well, if we do it right. If we don't, it looks like two guys letting each other beat each other up. Or worse, two guys letting each other pretend to beat each other up. And therein lies the problem. Unfortunately, it's often not that difficult to be a pro wrestler on TV. If you have a look, if you played some college football, if your dad used to be one, you can be on TV sometimes in a few months. What's difficult and formidably demanding, however, is to be a good one. And if you're not, wrestling is every bit as fake and phony as people say. I have no interest in that. What I am interested in is the art form. Recreating a physical contest such that people believe it and are moved by it in the same way as if it were. When you wrestle, you're an actor, no different than on a movie screen or in a theater. The way you stand, the way you move, every strike, every hold, every reaction to a strike or hold must ring true, or the illusion is lost. Someone once said that acting is the stuff between the lines. Wrestling, then, is the stuff between the moves. When you wrestle, it's like ballet. There's the same grace of two bodies working in unison, creating the illusion of conflict using moves that require skill and practice to perfect and execute safely. When you wrestle, you're a storyteller, learning over the years how to structure a match, when to do the moves, some planned, some ad-libbed, to draw the fans in. Setting things up to be paid off later. Reacting off the crowd, giving them what they expect, just not when they expect it. Because when they don't know what's going to happen next, you've got them. For that to really happen, something out of the ordinary needs to happen. Sometimes planned, often not, that shocks them. But even then, it is all for nothing without the crowd. When it does all come together, every action passes the scrutiny. Something extraordinary happens. The story draws them in. Only on that night, in that building, with those people. It's magic. And for those moments, ah, oh, it's like nothing you'll ever experience. Like you're at the center of the universe conducting. Like even for those few moments you touched immortality, caught lightning in a bottle, 
were part of something profound. You forgive every missed punch, every bad storyline, because you felt the magic. I felt it as a fan when I was 14. I felt it in my first match. I feel it now, and with a tear in my eye, I will feel it when I'm grey and old. And that is what I spent my life pursuing. By 2007 then, I was wrestling all over the world. I became champion for Ring of Honor. As my 15 month reign went on, I began to be considered in many people's eyes one of the best professional wrestlers in the world. And a lot of people were tipping me as the next big star in the industry. Yeah, I mean, Nigel McGuinness, I mean, at, at one point in his career, he was having some of the best matches in the world. Some of which were with my longtime rival and friend, American Dragon, Brian Danielson. Nigel and I tend to bring out the best in each other, I think, in the ring. When we're outside the ring, we bicker a lot. <laughs> We'd wrestled and beating each other up, everywhere from Liverpool, England, to Sydney, Australia, to New York City. So it was fitting, perhaps, when we were both signed to WWE at the same time. It was as though we'd gone through the war together, and now we were coming out on the other side. And our dreams were finally coming true. Dragon went on to achieve his dream and became a superstar in WWE. While, as I said, even though the public never knew why, I ended up in TNA. I remember there was a day I woke up and I got online. Nigel McGinnis was on Yahoo trending now. I'm like... <laughs> Within weeks, however, that disappointment quickly faded as I proved both my health and my ability in a fantastic feud and series of matches with Olympic gold medalist Kurt Angle. That winter, we wrestled all over Europe in huge arenas full of thousands of fans and for that moment, I touched my dream. I was in national newspapers and even had my own trading card and action figure. Once we got back to America, Hulk Hogan and a lot of the biggest names in the business joined TNA. And I got to be in the ring with some of my childhood heroes. Relatively quickly, however, my star began to fade, eventually leading to arguably overly sensationalized storylines and hardcore matches. My star continued to fall until I was brought back as part of a tag team. But, well, you know what happened next. Unlike everyone else though, you know why. I think a lot of people have, have read on the internet that I've got hepatitis C and everybody else thinks I've just got brain damage. So. I mean, it's went from concussions to hepatitis to AIDS. You know why people have to start believing in one of those things? Why? Because you're that good. And they know that unless it's something that crazy, you would still be with TNA or you would be with WWE. I mean, that's not true at all. I could have just retired, disappeared, slinked off in bitterness and disappointment. But I needed closure. I needed one last chance to say goodbye to the fans, to my friends, to the business I spent my life pursuing, and to come to terms with not getting to WWE and what led to my demise in TNA. And to try to understand if that 14 year old boy who dreamed of being a professional wrestler could see me now would he see our dream as a success or a failure? As you can see, uh, one of the skills that any independent professional wrestler worth his salt knows is how to pack a carry-on bag with as much merchandise as, in, as is physically possible. Over here, I have my new tour shirt. There's a small, a medium, a large, an extra large, and a double large. Because... 
I'm wearing them all on the plane tomorrow. Fantastic, because there's no room in the bag. I know I'm not going to be able to wrestle the same sort of matches that I could when I was in my prime. I mean, uh, it's the last chance you're going to see me wrestling. So uh, I'm hoping that's worth something. Even if I only got one camera, no one is shooting, no fucking microphone. Yet, that's coming on Wednesday. Someone is supposed to be able to pick me up, but I'm not sure who. I've lost weight since I last saw you. Well, see, we're keeping there everything even in the world. On the way to the show, Eddie Edwards' car broke down. So we're hoping he'll be here by the start of the show. No, we're hoping he'll be here by the start of my match. So for all of those people that think, you know, wrestling's about planning out hours in advance. I have to see something that isn't. Oh, what fucking time is this, eh? It had been 15 months since I last wrestled. I didn't know if I'd ever wrestle again. It was though I'd been holding my breath for all that time. And now finally, I could breathe again. wrestling hurts, you know what I mean? It really fucking does. Fake, fake it is not. It's good, it's good, I'm happy. I'm alive. Didn't get hurt, didn't hurt anyone. Thank you, sweetheart. Right, it's 12.30 of an evening, and uh, we are hungry, which is why we are going to Moe's place. So why do you hate wrestling? I don't, I, I don't hate wrestling. Well, the question. <laughs> you know, you guys have been to WWE and you've experienced that, so now you have a sense of satisfaction, whether it lived up to what you... Sure. You know what I mean? Whereas I never did. I, I, so I'm now feeling almost as though my life was a failure because of it. You know, when you first tell people you're going to be a wrestler, people sort of poo-poo it. Mm. Mm. You go, right, I'm going to fucking prove them wrong, you know what I mean? And I proved them right. <laughs> I, I think it's a rotten motivation. Life works according to your beliefs. And if you're never going to catch a break, then you're never going to catch a break. But you've, you've decided that. I always used to find that this time was, was my favorite time of wrestling. I say it all the time, the yeah. time between shows. Yeah. My absolute favorite. And you're on the road, you're, having, you're chatting about things and having a laugh. And that's the freedom that people don't have who work regular jobs. I think that's, you know, that's the perk of it. I spent a lot of the tour thinking about wrestling on the independent scene, where I'd spent the majority of my career, trying to understand why we do it. Because, I mean, no one wants to be an independent wrestler. I think we all want to get to WWE. When you start off, you do it because, while it wasn't your dream, it's still pro wrestling. This was always what I wanted to do. And once you start, you love it. You love it because you got into it in the first place because you loved it, you know. And some of us never stop loving it. I do, I love it. I still get just as jacked. I still really? get it that excited, whether it's 20,000 or 20. There's been things I've been good at for this. 
my life doing it. For a lot of us, it's a break from normal life. It's like a different life. Sometimes a chance to work with your childhood heroes. And being able to sit beside him and do commentary. It was the closest to having sex with a man that I've ever <laughs> And then there's all the places you wouldn't otherwise go. You know, I've been to Spain, I was in Turkey two weeks ago. Right. I just wouldn't be able to do any of that stuff if it wasn't for this job. And all the people you wouldn't otherwise meet. You hang out with people yeah. for yeah. a weekend or two yeah. weeks straight, you won't see them first. Some of whom, for moments in your life, become your closest friends. Bison had me doing whiskey shots. Guys like Bison Smith, who we only ever saw in Japan, but was like an older brother to all of us. Fucking pay them! I don't I have no money! There's a reality to putting your body in someone else's hands. Not unlike the army that forms a bond, like family. I look at you like you're my older brother. You feel like you're on the same journey together. I just sent my tape in the WWE, so... <laughs> so part of why you do it is the things you share with these people. My first link was to send me on the back of a PWI magazine. The memories. He went one, two, and Arby's roast beef sandwich landed right in front of his face on the ring and exploded. The experiences. Tonight you're gonna be Black Tiger, right? I didn't even give him a mask. <laughs> Just because he was black, he called him Black Tiger. The compassion. So this is the end for you. Can I say? From an English person like myself, who's not from England at all. <laughs> Good fucking riddance, that's what I'm going to say. My life was a tragedy. I, I love wrestling. Now I can't wrestle anymore. Please feel sorry for me. <laughs> I'm Mark Briscoe. Eventually, however, a lot of this can fade. You start doing it because you love it, and then, you know, have days where you don't like it so much. So why keep doing it? Because we have hope. You know, we, we all hope for that one last run. You know, maybe somebody will pick me up and I'll get, I got one last run at me. You know, like maybe I can work a year or two for WWE or hell, I'd work the ring crew. I don't care. Instead, instead of working at Home Depot or, yeah. or stocking groceries at Kroger or whatever, you're still around the business and you're still doing something that you love. But as much because you're afraid of if you don't, afraid you'll be a failure. Afraid of the people who said you couldn't and what they'll say now. Like, oh, so you went back to school, good. You finally got this wrestling out of your system. Yeah, all right. You try to make it seem like, oh, I'm chasing my dream, and this is great that I'm chasing my dream. I'm doing this wonderful thing by chasing my dream. Yeah. But it, like, by walking away and being like, oh, it's okay, it's almost like an admission that, like, you know, it wasn't as great as maybe you made it out to be. But ultimately, whether you're starting out or you've been doing it for years, you do it for the same reason people come to watch you. The same reason you watched as a fan. You felt the magic. Oh, there's nothing like it. I mean, when you can get the people eating out of your hand and you're conducting them, just like bring them up and bring them down, the emotions, and it's a high that no drug can actually ever give you. Mm. My favorite place to eat in the whole of America. We used to have me over their apartment and we'd go swimming together <laughs> yeah. in the pool. And Andre with his goggles, you know, a <laughs> grown man wearing goggles. Andre was one of our friends from the local wrestling scene. His contract with WWE had been rescinded about the same time as mine, in his case, for testing positive for HIV. Six months before I'd started the tour, he'd made national news after being charged with 12 counts of felonious assault for allegedly not disclosing his HIV status to sexual partners. He's now facing, what, 120 years in prison, right? Yeah. Internet websites have spread a lot of lies and mistruths, saying he'd purposely bled in numerous matches after the fact. I personally offer anybody the HWA video collection mm. to find these matches because they don't exist. Um, you know, people come up to my girlfriend and say, aren't you worried? You know, Andre and Tim lived together for a while, aren't you? Oh are God. you, you know, he was like, he used the same toilet, he used the same soap. Really? That's, yeah, I mean, that's people absolutely just, frightening in this day and age. Andre hitting a guy with a forearm when he was a manager yeah. with two or three layers on oh isn't going to give you HIV, right. but you'll, you'll, you guys will publicly cry about it. Yeah. You know, they will bring up the fact that they you know, shared the same women. You know, WWE's got it right. No fucking bleeding. I mean, but there's people themselves should be smart for that. So tired. And, and kind of worried. It, just hearing them talk about how they're all freaking out Everybody's like, oh my god, he could have given me HIV from hugging me or giving me a forearm. 
you know, I'm just really second guessing myself. The next day I had lunch with Les, my original trainer, and the issue kept coming up. See, I don't know. Everybody's C, B, A, D. I don't know. Right. But I was, I was, I never was so weak as anything in my whole fucking life. Yeah. You could thump my liver like it was a watermelon. Really? He said one sharp kick or punch, it would rupture. You'd have been dead before you hit the ground. I'd worked with the Andersons uh, that night in Danville, and they ran to the doctor, but nobody had it with me. Right. I was talking to Tim Tolman about, um, about Andre Hart, you know, and... and and, and, oh, and, and blood in this fucking industry today, people just gushing fucking blood. Well, how does that fucking work? I don't know. It's fucking stupidity that even in this day and age, it still happens in this fucking industry. Even the next day when I caught up with Cody Hawk, one of my oldest friends in wrestling, yeah. we quickly got around to the subject. You know, and I had wrestled him just 12 months prior. When he was so way too positive? Yeah. Were you worried? Were you freaking out? Or were you more... Mm. Not necessarily. I never shared women with him. Yeah. You know, but I was worried because I knew he was sleeping with rats. Right. And the rats were sleeping with all the boys. Right. You never knew, you know, how many of the boys whatever rat had been with. I was really upset about it because I thought I was one of his boys. Right. I thought we were close. And if he would have just came to me when he first found out mm -hmm. and just said, you know, I'm, I'm sick and I want to keep this on the download. I want the world to know. But, you know, somewhere along the line, I don't think I would have had a problem wrestling him. I know I can work a match without getting cut. Or that, that would have helped him. Just, that's, that's it. My boys are my boys, even, you know, if, if you get sick or whatever, you're still my boy. My heart was racing as he was talking. I felt for a moment he was talking about me. Maybe, in some way, he was. Lucky to have you, even if you didn't realise, you know what I mean? Yeah. That's, um... This is uh, going to be one of my last matches ever, so uh, it's obviously where I started off as well, so it's nice to be able to come back. See so many young guys who are hungry and, you know, enjoying the business. Carry on enjoying the business, you know, because it doesn't last forever. It's not like I feel like I want to wrestle anymore or I haven't should wrestle anymore, you know. I know it's time for me to move on. It's just tough when it's it's right here and it's and I feel good doing it. What are you gonna tell me about the match tonight? Um, I, I can't wait to see it. Um yeah. uh, you know, Nigel and my dad, they're gonna have a great match. Wolf, Shark Boy, whose side are you gonna be on? Whose side are you gonna be on? Well, it's I'm obvious gonna... because I have this shirt right yeah, here. Yeah, but you you, <laughs> you you have to wear that shirt, don't you? I think deep down you're really on on my side, right? Maybe, yeah. yeah. When I first got to America, Sharky helped me as much as anyone. He let me crash on his couch, helped me buy my first car and took me to shows, smarting me up to so many aspects of wrestling. Wrestling him on one of my last shows was a really big deal for me. He here is one of his final matches on this little this farewell tour. It means it really means a lot to me. I, I think it means a lot to him. That we're, we're basically uh, not too far from where we, you know, where we both broke into this business. And uh, we're actually in the town where uh, my kid goes to school here at this school. It's got a whole lot of meaning for me on a lot of different levels.
My little boy Dylan, stand up and wave, Dylan. Stand up and wave, everybody. My son goes from school here. And the last guy I want to say is Nigel McGinnis. Desmond Wolf, whatever you want to call him. He is one of the toughest. SOB, I have ever faced in that ring. And he's retired from wrestling real soon. This is his retirement tour. And I'm real proud to have been a part of it. Come on out here. I always thought like if you never give up and you try your hardest you can you'll make it you know what I mean the cream rises to the top and I it's just not true <laughs> the guys that, the nice guys the ones that deserve it a lot of them never do get the right. opportunity you know so I mean so how do you look at that do you just do you just you know say oh well that's right well it's not like you're a failure man you you, so, you yeah. did a heck of a lot and no hardcore wrestling fan doesn't know who you are and isn't impressed by you man they're, yeah. they're, and you made it to TV how many guys make it to TV you made it to TV bro you know I just consider myself really lucky. This is something I started telling people when I was 11 years old I wanted to do. Yeah. And here I'm standing here in front of you now, I'm 36 years old, and, and it's all I've done for the last 14 years or whatever. That's pretty amazing. It's nice today to, you know, have, have your son out there and say, yeah. him, right? There was nothing like that, man. man. Yeah. And it's just like what you said, man. There's more life than wrestling, bro. My kid asked me, he's like, Dad, is being a wrestler like the coolest thing ever? I was like, no, being your dad is the coolest thing oh, ever. Man. You know, and I mean yeah. it. I really do mean it. I said being a wrestler is the second coolest thing I ever did. Yeah. Ah, uh, Ohio in the fall. We are in search of the tree from Shawshank Redemption. Do you reckon like anyone ever had sex underneath it? <laughs> you ever have sex outside? Yeah. You did? I have. With somebody else? <laughs> See those chips? Is that it? No, I'm going to say that. That looks like a tree that's split in half, right? Oh, what a day. There was something about visiting that wall. Maybe because I watched the movie at the same time of life as I first dreamt of being a professional wrestler. That night I wasn't wrestling because, quite frankly, I wasn't a big enough name for the money I wanted. So I sat and watched the show, selling the odd picture to fans with the faint recollection they might have once seen me on TV. Well, I was just saying, uh, I do, I feel kind of bad. Do you look a little jaded or? So it's different doing these shows now before when I do these shows, I, I feel like I was on my way up, you know? Now, being here and, um, no, no, I'm not on my way up and it's all gonna be over very shortly. And that was it. I still say though, you gotta uh, you gotta remember you've made it a lot farther than the rest of us. Uh, a lot of guys would love to have made it as far as you and been the places you've been. And I know, I know. Try to be uh, thankful for it. No, I know, I should be. You're right, absolutely. You know. And like you were saying earlier, you believe in if you have the dream, you can chase the dream. And now you think, well, I chased it, I gave it my all, and maybe you can achieve the dream. That makes me sad. I feel like it's wearing on you a little bit. You've got one life, you know. So you feel like one of those guys that landed on the moon but never got to walk on it. The people that get to walk on the moon get paid for it for the rest of their <laughs> life. The people that don't, don't. And I hate to say it's about money because it's not necessarily about money, you know. But, but it, I mean, 
the difference between getting signed by WWE and having a run there and not is huge. Money-wise, you know, you're talking every bit of a hundred grand. If I seem overly hung up or bitter about not getting to WWE, let me explain the whole story and see if you understand. I want to congratulate both Brian and Nigel. Both these guys have worked so hard. When I went for my WWE medical, I passed every test. They earned the right to go to a worldwide stage. For drugs, for bloodborne illnesses, and for physical health. The doctor asked me, however, if I'd had any injuries in the past. He said if there was an issue, they'd fix it. But if I didn't disclose something and they found out, I'd be fired. My bicep injuries were common knowledge, but I'd seen an orthopedic specialist who'd advised me to avoid surgery by resting and letting them scar in place to where I'd still have functional strength. I couldn't have afforded surgery anyway, and as it turned out, I changed my style and my arms were perfectly fine. The WWE doctor felt them and agreed, but to be safe wanted to see the original MRIs. When he saw them, however, he said that I needed to get new MRIs done as he felt the left bicep should have been surgically repaired. More money, more time. When he saw the new MRIs, he concurred and told me over the phone he couldn't clear me to be hired. I went back to my original orthopedic doctor who stood by his prognosis and to be fair, I'd wrestled without an issue for two years. He wrote a letter confirming this, that my arm was no more likely to get injured than if it had never been torn in the first place. But it didn't matter. WWE rescinded my contract. I could have had the surgery their doctor suggested, but at $5,000, when I was already broke from waiting for them to decide and wouldn't be able to work for the six months it would take to heal, not to mention the fact that no one in WWE would return my calls to say if they'd even be interested then, well, what would you do? TNA had called me the day of my last show for Ring of Honor and told me that they would hire me if WWE didn't. I already had an idea by then there might be an issue. And so I called them back, explained the arm issue, gave them my orthopedic doctor's letter. And the next week, when the wrestling world still thought I was going to WWE, I showed up in TNA and had one of the best matches of the year against Kurt Angle. And for the record, wrestling for TNA for over a year with a busier schedule than ever before in my career, my arm has never been hurt again. It's weird, I, I, I sat there tonight and thought, well, why do I care whether they know who I am? I guess it comes back to what you do it for. Do you do it for the love of the art? Do you do it because, you know, that's what gives you enjoyment or you do it because that you want to be famous? I think I always wanted to be famous. <laughs> kind of shallow, perhaps. Do you think your window is actually closing right now? You're not going to want to stay out of this business. You're not. Man called me and said we want to give you a job, then I'd wrestle for WWE. It'd be a step up, I'd make money, I'd have some guarantees, and it'd be worth it. I've called, I've tried to make my fucking my, my presence felt, you know, see if there's interest, and there isn't. Regardless if you're in wrestling or not, I think that I've made someone that I will know and keep in contact with uh, yeah, my entire so, life. You know, I don't want to hear that you're dead in a few years yeah. or stuff like that, so you really gotta, you know, just get back in shape and quit that smoking and oh, you boy. know what I mean? <laughs> yes. I, I want to have you around for a long time, mate, you know? I don't want to... Well, I appreciate that. I don't want to go to another funeral in this business. Okay. It's kind of weird saying goodbye to Kev there uh, like that. Strange sense that I wasn't going to see him again. My premonition about Kevin was wrong. 
but thinking back to that feeling now, I get chills down my spine when I realise three days later, Bison Smith died. The night before I was leaving for England, my roommate came in the room and just said Bison. I could tell from his face what he meant. For the next hour, I sat there packing in silence, because what words are there that haven't been said before? About those six guys that came from Memphis. The Haas brothers, the Island Boys, Bradley and Kate. Wow. Yeah. Charlie Haas and, and Rosie, the only two left alive. Mm. And it's not just the people that have died necessarily, it's it, it's the, the injuries and, and, and a lot of the fucking emotional and physical trauma that goes along with it, you know? This is not one point that you sit there and think, hang on, is this really worth it? There's just still something there, you know. The wrestling business is, is dying, you know. The boys are dying, and, but there's still something there that makes me want to do it. Here we are, finally back in England. How do you feel about me retiring and not wrestling anymore? Um. Very pleased, really, because I don't have to worry about you getting injured anymore. I think it was like a silly pipe dream, or no? no. Uh, I thought you might actually grow out of it. Yeah. You don't think it was a waste of time, then? Not at all. Being a wrestler. No. no. You could have been doing something really boring. It's been really nice being back here and um, seeing my parents and remembering how it felt to. Uh, to feel so secure and, and loved that I could go and pursue my dreams and, and know that no matter what happened, I could always come back here and be safe and secure. I don't think I'll ever be able to tell them how grateful I am. Just kind of disappointing to, you know, here I am, 35 year old, coming back and, you know, not having achieved my dream and, and not having been able to come back and buy my parents dinner. And, you know, I mean, Christ, they had to, they had to freaking pay for my flight to come back here. I'm sure they'd say as long as I'm happy, they're happy. And I just want to be able to say it was worth it. And that they're proud. I thought, well, that'll make me a millionaire with them. That was my plan. <laughs> you know, I always thought, well, you and Mum always took care of me so much and, uh, Gave me the sort of freedom to pursue my dreams. I... You know what they say? What's that? Money isn't everything. It's usually poor people that say money isn't everything. Right? Yeah, well, <laughs> <laughs> what your grandma used to say, that uh, the most important thing in life is your health. And without your health, the money means nothing. Well, the worst thing is all the illnesses you don't know you have, aren't they? Right. And that's why, in a way, um, in a way, you were quite fortunate. If you would just found out now, and you'd have gone through the last year as normal, then it could have been a... A lot worse, right? It never would have been... All right. Thanks, Indy. OK, take it, mate.
Cheers for the uh, many, many years of wrestling. We can go back in the future. Cheers. Even my girlfriend thinks a word of you from TNA. Oh, she's, where is your girlfriend? She's at home at the moment. Uh, okay. At least you know, she's one of the best Desmond Wolf. Seems like I'm going to see Desmond Wolf on Man It's like... Yeah. It's just, it's a bit fucking surreal for me at the moment because I absolutely fucking adore you as like a pro wrestler. I'm sorry, I'm just a bit, uh, I'm, a bit I'm a bit choked up at the moment, that's all. Very honoured tonight uh, to be part of the Nigel McGuinness Retirement Tour. One of the big names from to come from the UK. I think everyone here agrees it's a privilege to have you here with us tonight. Uh, Can everybody hear me? Yeah! Oh, you are the best crowd I think I've ever wrestled for in my entire life. very well. Very well. Uh, one of the guys I wrestled tonight. He came to me and he said, Law, I need to tell you something. And his eyes were all welled up. Nigel McGuinness is retiring. And I'm going to fight him as part of his retirement tour. And literally, like, he was going to burst into tears because he's such a massive fan and always has been. Very few English wrestlers make it. Um, and to all of us here, you know, you you made it. Yes, sweet. Thank you. Come on, just give me a kiss. Me too. Unbelievable. It's like she doesn't even like me. It's um gone three o'clock now. I'm as you can hear, I'm about to lose my fucking voice. We've lost. Um, fuck off. We've lost. <laughs> Chastity pillow in place. <laughs> there we oh, are. Oh boy. It's like Bert and Andy. <laughs> Good night, Bert. Oh, it's so scary. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm running about an hour and a half sleep. I've got a fucking European cheese mountain growing on my teeth. <laughs> Representing. Done that, he's fought against the world best. I do. Mean, McGuinness catches him out. Oh, look at that. finds that single leg take. Redman takes the legs. Looking for a figure four, perhaps. Bolts over. The legs are spread. He's got it. Have so you seen Russia before? I have. What did you think tonight? I'm very professional. I'm sad that you lost, but a bit like dancing, you know, keeping in sequence and all that sort of thing. I wrestled tonight in Sittingbourne closest venue to where I grew up. Kind of an epiphany of sorts to me, really. And watching the rest of the show and seeing some of the other guys on the show, you know, and just how talented those guys are now, and it just made it ever so clear to me. I don't want to say that the business has passed me by. 
but with all their younger British guys going to WWE now, it just made it so abundantly clear to me that my goal to be a WWE wrestler has failed. There's no Hollywood ending to this story. I generally wanted to prove that if you're, you know, if you're a young guy and you've got a dream and you never give up and you bust your ass and you believe in yourself, then you can achieve it. I don't know, and I can hear it now. I can hear people's voices in my head now saying, well, but you don't believe it. You've just given up. Never say quit, you know. Fuck them. Go back to Ring of Honor. Make a name for yourself again. Just prove that you can still wrestle. They have to give you a shot. The truth is they don't. They don't have to give me a fucking shot ever. And at some point my body is going to be fucking broken down. I'm not going to have any way of moving on from this. About an hour to go. Quite excited. No, I'm not. I'm just glad to be awake. It is fucking freezing and uh, we are in Preston and why anybody lives here is beyond me. People often ask me about my favourite match. This is close. couple of hours in the pouring rain it's cold it's kind of miserable it's it's England oh god I look pressure's off and you just have fun. So much of my career I didn't even think about that. Somewhere in the back of my head I still think there's a chance. Like, you know, this is uh, gonna be Christmas soon and Christmas is the time of miracles. And Why could I not just accept it was over? Wrestling empresario Alex Shane. Was it what happened in TNA? I mean, so many people have asked me for the last six months, a year. It's crazy the things that you hear and you, you hear reported as fact. These people who are reporting as fact have no either A, concept or B, consideration of, of the effects that that could have on either A, your career or B, your personal life. Well, I heard it. Someone told me it. So let's put this out here. And well, well, what about if I'm married? What about, you know, if I've got a, a job interview? What, all these different things that can affect your life. But for some reason, people seem to think that because because I'm somewhat in the in the public sphere, then everything's fair game. And don't get me wrong, you know, like a lot of people have contacted me and said, you know, I don't know what happened or whatever else, but I just hope you're healthy. I mean, I've been blessed, genuinely blessed. That part of this tour, the people have come up to me and shook my hands and said, you know, you, you've had such a great impact in either my wrestling career or me as a wrestling fan. I loved your matches, and in time, if, if it's the right time, then you know, I'll I'll, I'll tell my story. Or maybe I needed to find resolution from one of my peers. One of my childhood inspirations and professional idols was Robbie Brookside. His video diaries documentary in the early 90s was one of the reasons I wanted to be a wrestler. Yeah. Right. Anyway, welcome to Wrestle Lester. Now, nearly two decades later, his career was winding down. I often thought of Robbie and felt a kinship to him. Like me, he had travelled all over the world, working for nearly every major organisation, but had never found real fame or fortune. I hoped somehow, having as much respect for him as anyone, he could help me find resolution to the dream his documentary had partly inspired. So we, we all met up after the show. I went like that, what did you think, Taz, he went? He never swore me. Bloody hell, you're fast, aren't you? Bloody fast. And that was his... Yeah. His, uh, his uh, opinion and his... 
is right up with me, me, me career in wrestling being yeah, fast. But I, you know, if it was only one time, it was one time, and I'm happy. But, well, maybe it wasn't the resolution I was looking for. I felt honoured to have shared that story and perhaps understood a little more why we pursue our dreams for the people who love us. He's a good lad, is Robbie. He's a good guy. He's a, it's not just him as a wrestler, it's, it's him as a human being. <laughs> Maybe there was where I could find resolution. The day you were born, you looked at me as much to say, oh no, not you again. Just, that was just expression in your eyes and on your face. <laughs> what? You believe things happen for a reason, do you? Mm. You do? Mm. Not sure if I do. If you want to believe in a destiny or things happening for a reason, then maybe my destiny was not to achieve my dream necessarily, but it was to pursue it and tell my story. Mm. Okay. I love my brother. <laughs> <laughs> it's a very aggressive dog or monkey. Brilliant manager, great team. Thank you. Cheer up, Nigel. I think you should focus a bit more on congratulating yourself on how far you have got. You're someone who, at 10 years old, got Sky TV and said, I want to be a wrestler. And you've been a wrestler. Makes sense, right? Why then, hearing it from the people I loved as much as anyone, did it not start to sink in? I mean, I'd heard it again and again from my friends. So have a little kid tap on the window because he saw you eating lunch in Browns in Islington. That, to me, equals made it. Really? Yeah. And there were other things to look forward to in life things that maybe I'd missed out on because of wrestling. Get off my ear. Jennifer. <laughs> Terrible Uncle Nigel teaching you to punch people already. I used to have like something similar, but it was like cut off. Oh! <laughs> was I being stupid? Did I need to have it hammered into my head? I have to see one of my best friends in the whole world. Hey boy, can't <laughs> argue with a sat nav. <laughs> You lost weight. You are a bearded <laughs> old man. Now you've got to say some nice things about me being a wrestler. Uh, in honesty, I've only known two wrestlers. Dragon. Yeah. He was a nice guy. Yeah. I um, quite like Dragon. I, I don't karaoke with Dragon. Good, good a guy. Wrestler, right? Well, technically, I think Dragon no, was probably. In every way. Really? In every way. Where is Dragon now? Uh, I don't know. WWE? Yeah, living on a... Where are you? Living on a farm somewhere. I mean, you're a house, mate. Fucking coming to see you, so... You're like one that. of the best wrestlers in the world. I yes. love you like a brother. I, I understand, yes, I've done lots of things I never would have done, but it's still a tremendous sense of disappointment. I never got to WWE. I never made the sort of money to where I can retire. Oh, but then, then are you judging your um, failing on finances? Yes. Then you failed? Yes. But that was that was never your dream, was it? When you used to run after the bus in Glebe, it was never for money. Yes, never. I didn't have any money. Yeah. No. <laughs> if I could afford a bus ticket, I wouldn't have fucking I would have taken a bus. If it was me wanting to be do something with my life, you know what I mean? And so that when anybody else that has a dream can go, oh, you know what, fucking Nigel had a fucking dream and he never gave up and he made it. So, you know, that's an But you're the only one who says he thinks you haven't made it. A 15 year old kid is thinking about what he's going to do with his life. Yeah. You know, he doesn't think I've made it. A 15 year old kid will put Desmond Wolf or Nigel McGuinness into Google and he'll come with over 4 million results. Yeah, yeah, maybe you're right in that. Yeah, yeah, that's. You know what I mean? Do you know how many results come up for Alan Lewis? Back in hundreds, but none hundreds. of you. Pedophile, <laughs> that's it. Alan Lewis the pedophile. Yeah. Really? Mary Toff, do you want to know when you come up for Mary Toff? Millions. But that's because she gave birth to rabbits. <laughs> <laughs> so there's people who've had pictures with you this week and last week who are over the moon. Yeah. Really over the moon. It's like, man, can't believe I had a picture of you know, Nigel or Desmond. He's lost a bit of weight. But <laughs> <laughs> And uh, about half an hour, I need to go to uh, the crazy house for my appearance. No idea what it's going to be like. First time I've done an appearance. <laughs> a 
If I had any doubts about my celebrity, they were quickly assuaged when within seconds of being in the booth, this fella came right up to me. apologized to me afterwards he was like oh sorry there weren't more people there i didn't say it but i was like felt like christ well wasn't that supposed to be my job but the other thing is i'm okay with it you know whether you work a regular job and you have your two vacations a year and your nice apartment and or whether you, you know, do go a different direction and pursue your dreams and it's just life, it's all perception, it's just got to be happy. <laughs> it's that fucking simple. And... Eight in the morning, I'm running on about five hours sleep. I've got the fucking training seminars at 10 o'clock this morning, 10.30 this morning, two hours away. Okay, um, Jesus, it's colder in here than, than anywhere. Um, As part of the tour, sometimes I'd give seminars before the shows to make a little extra cash. You can do a good head bridge, it's always good. It makes you look a little bit more professional than a lot of the other guys. It's your neck muscles that are going to protect your brain when you take those bumps and your brain's rattling around inside your skull. Taking a knee because I'm, I'm I'm humbled by that round of applause. Thank you. I can't believe that was the last time I'm ever going to wrestle in front of a crowd here in England. Well, look, you're all standing on your feet. I couldn't want for a better crowd. You guys are here because you understand how difficult it is for us to come out here and wrestle these matches, and you love it and you support it. And God bless you because without you guys, there wouldn't be a place for me and all the other boys to learn our trade and be the best wrestlers that we can. We don't know why we love it, but we love it. God bless you. Keep pro wrestling. was the end of my career in England. God, I feel kind of sad. Look all the fucking bullshit posture in the world. I ain't gonna change a fucking thing anyway. It's all in the journey, not the fucking destination. The fuck it is obvious, it's clear and fucking clear. Everything I am or not, didn't do, not all the fucking, fucking introspection and fucking conversations and emails from people in the world isn't gonna change a fucking thing. Just fucking accept that. Move on. Maybe if you can do that, if you can fucking just accept it and move on, then you'll find something else that's fucking good in your life and be successful. The anger came from feeling like life had dealt me a bad hand. At the risk of sounding self-indulgent, allow me to explain why I might feel that way and the full story of my experience with hepatitis B. Right, so you disappear, you're off television, you're done. Um, what's the story? Hepatitis B is a completely different virus to Hepatitis C. 
most people, 90%, get rid of the virus on their own, like the flu, within six months. I was told not to worry, that I continued to be used in a non-wrestling role so I could make some money. I wasn't. Six months later, however, I hadn't cleared the virus, and so I was put on antiviral medication. Eventually, I was brought back in a commissioner role on a secondary show, but less than a month after that, I was fired. And less than a month after that, I tested negative and was cleared to wrestle. I will never know for sure how I got the virus. What I do know is how I didn't get it. I never shared needles and never had unprotected sex. What I do know is there is a vaccine for hepatitis B available cheaply from your local health department. What I do know is hepatitis B, hepatitis C, HIV and numerous other viruses are carried in blood. Today, more than two years after the original diagnosis, I have developed the antibodies to the virus and am hence immune. But I couldn't keep quiet. I had to say something. It's my hope that people will stop intentionally bleeding on shows, promotions will stop allowing it, fans will stop supporting it, and wrestlers will get tested and get vaccinated. I may not have got hepatitis B from other wrestlers bleeding around me, but by them doing so, they certainly could have got it from me. We were just lucky I got tested when I did. I chose to wait to tell my story until now because I know I only had one chance to make this mean something. My last ever weekend on the road wrestling. You know, I just realized this is Pittsburgh, isn't it? This is where I came for my WWE tryout. I think actually the last time I was here was when I came here for it and telling the doctor that I had a torn bicep in the past cost me my job with WWE and my entire future in this industry, pretty much. So listen to you all, lie. <laughs> that was where I sat, waiting for Dragon to get the rental car at the 2008 Playboy Playmate of the Year, who, may I add, was hired by WWE after testing because she hadn't had any injuries wrestling. Because she hadn't wrestled. She hadn't done any sports at all. So how can I really come away? You've got some money saved? <laughs> I had a lot of sympathy for Nick Rowe. I was scared to death of him when we first met because of his hardcore style. But I'd come to know him as an intelligent and caring human being who was really trapped into wrestling that style. I don't know. Wrestling's a local fella. I'd hope when he was in the movie The Wrestler, he'd be able to get out. I kind of wanted to see you make some money. Ah, you know I mean? uh, but hey, man, I'm having fun, you know. Yeah? You alright? Yeah, for now, man. For now. There's always, there's always tomorrow. Sometimes there isn't. That's tomorrow. the trouble. Sometimes there isn't. Tomorrow. There's only seven hours car ride away. That's all there is tomorrow. A little bit concerned after seeing some of those pictures and stuff. And I talked to the promoter and he said that he, because I asked him before and I said, absolutely no, I, I just can't, you know, I can't go on a show with this stuff. Um, and he agrees and he said that he won't and he's asked people if I see it, then, I, then I'm going to have to change the canvas or something, but I'm not, I'm not going on after fucking blood. So you think about a ring after here? Necrome Viper didn't mean to bleed, and that it happened by accident. But you can imagine how I felt. Especially when this happened afterwards. I didn't get it on tape, but the ring announcer cut his head open with a spike in front of everyone to show his support for Necro. And he handed the belt for the next match. He cut himself? Did you see that? No, I did not. No, I'm no, I no. You're not telling me anything that I, you're you're preaching to the choir. I do not like it. I don't want it around. This gives you an idea of the issue. Don had the best intentions, 
but for some of the wrestlers, that's all they know. And as you saw with Necro, sometimes it happens by accident. As he said, Don changed the canvas and has never since had blood on one of his shows. This is the last match ever of Nigel McGuinness. Thank you very much, hey, guys. Man. Great to That's see you. That's the greatest wrestler in the world, right here. How long did that take you? Two days. Well, <laughs> I can't tell you how much that means to me. It really is. That's great. Fantastic. Anyway, thanks for having me out, mate. You know, it's a good area. I've been doing it. No reason why you should be inside. Twelve years is a lot of your life. In that moment, I thought back to a lot of the memories along the journey. Why is it in fairy tales? There always is a happy ending. Never in a fairy tale. Do you hear of a heart breaking? Just an everlasting love The kind that is awoken with a kiss If they wrote a book on us Oh baby it would go something like this Nearly made it Could have had it all Just to fall Who's to blame now It's too close to call But we were almost beautiful These guys are tiring tonight He's one of the greatest in the world We were almost beautiful This has been a long journey for me It was about 15, 20 years ago I sat in the crowd where you are all sat and dreamed of one day being a professional wrestler. Whether you have your first match on a small show in West Virginia, whether you wrestle the main event in, in WrestleMania, it's all the same thing. It's all professional wrestling. And whether you're there, here or anywhere, we all love it and that's why we keep doing it. It belongs to us. God bless you. Keep supporting and I will see you all on the other side. Who's to blame now? It's too close to call. We were almost beautiful. We were almost beautiful. That was it. That was the end of my career as a professional wrestler. Well, maybe it was more just the end of my tour. Yeah, to be a professional wrestler a long time ago. You know, I know that there are some people who, to them, you know, what I did wasn't nothing. It's just about me trying to understand genuinely what effect, if any, I had on the wrestling business and uh, if it was worth it. At that moment, I felt I'd found peace. But less than a day later, all the bitterness, frustration and anger finally boiled over. There's nothing wrong with my fucking bicep. It's fine. It was fine then. It's fine now. There's no reason I shouldn't have been hired by WWE. I went to TNA. I had those matches with Kurt Angle. I should have had a fucking spot there and a spot in this business the rest of my fucking life. I'm tired of fucking bullshitting, pussyfooting around it. I'm just going to fucking tell you how I fucking feel and that's the truth. 
The truth is it's bullshit. It's fucking not fair. I deserve that fucking spot. I was good enough then. I'm good enough now. But instead of that, I got lost in the fucking shovel at TNA, and then I got fucking hepatitis. Through no fucking fault of my own. It's just so damn unfair. And sometimes I wake up in the morning and I just feel sick when I realize and remember what the fuck happened to me. And yes, I know I've got no justification for feeling this way. And yes, oh my God, woe me, there are so many worse people off than me, and I get that. I understand that, but it doesn't no fucking difference. Still unfair, I still should have been there, and fuck you for giving a shit. Fuck! You're young. You have plenty of opportunity in life. You can do whatever you want. I'm so fucking tired of hearing that shit. And I know it's perception. I know I control whether I'm happy or sad. I know all of those fucking things and I just don't give a fuck. And now that I've vented, what can I do? I can stay angry, I can be mad, and, and I will be. And I don't think I'll ever come to terms with what happened to me. I think I'll ever go, well, if that hadn't happened, then this wouldn't have happened. I don't know. I do know that I didn't get half the stuff that I wanted to get on the fucking documentary, and I do know that fucking... I'm probably not going to be able to edit it together. And I do know that my whole life seems like a fucking waste of time and a fucking failure, and it's all my fault and because of the choices I made that I'm stuck here. I get it. Whoop de do. So kill yourself. So so fucking kill yourself. So so give up on life. So 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 what? When I was young, I just had a dream. I wanted to be a wrestler. I wanted to prove that if you've got a dream, you can make it. And I believed that. And that is why I paid my dues and I made my sacrifices and fucking God strike me down. If I didn't, just do my best. It's uh, midnight on Sunday night, and uh, Dragon just became the world heavyweight champion in WWE. And he sent me a text message. It just says, Hey Nigel, they just gave me the world heavyweight championship. I wish you were here to share it with me. I'm sorry that you're not. It just seems um, apropos day after I retire, after I have my last match, Dragon becomes world heavyweight champion. And I'm not sad. If anything, I feel a profound sense of, of, of pride. And we both went to WWE and we both had our tryouts and our, and our medicals and he was taken and bowed against the odds and prove to everybody that if you have a dream and you don't give up, you can make it. This is to my old buddy Dragon, without whom I never would have been half the wrestler I am. He made it. With that pride that even if I hadn't made it, my friend had, I finally came to a resolution. It's a little after midnight. I 
when I'm sitting here in the silence in the kitchen, thinking back to when I was a kid. And I'd sit in the kitchen in my parents' house, listening to the whir of the fridge, dreaming about growing up, pursuing my dreams, filled with nothing but hope and excitement. I was a little upset the other day. I think a lot of um, the tour, I came to some realizations, I came to some acceptances, if you will. And then it almost appeared like it was all for nothing. And I was just as upset and just as crazy mad at how unfair it was after it all. I think now I realize that epiphanies, resolutions, they're good for about as long as you can remember. And if there are any definites in life, it's change. There are times where I'll be okay with what happened to me. And then there are other times where I won't be able to see that. And all I can see is the, the unfairness of it all and how I had a dream and I deserve to get there. And I think if anything, if there is any epiphany to be had from all of this, is to just accept that. Either way, for now, I feel happy. What about my dream? Even though I didn't get to WWE, was it a failure? Were you doing something that you love? Were you able to live on the money you were making? Did you make a lot of friends? Did you leave an impression on the people that you met on your way through the business that when they talk about you after you're gone is positive? If you can say that those things happened, then I don't know how you can call your career a failure. You can't turn around and say that after your um, years in the business that you haven't made an impression because you have. The, the, the things I did, and when I try to look at all the things I got to do, the stories we have and the travels we've got, I mean, we've traveled all over the world for, for basically free. Uh, so I tried to look at those things because it's easy to go, well, fuck, man, like, nobody deserves anything, but I've worked hard and, I, and, and, and why didn't I get this opportunity? Or, or you can always do that, but, but that's not... Right. It's not healthy. If it's as simple as it ends up making you a better a better father when that when that chapter starts. If you haven't tried it, don't you think you'd have spent the rest, rest of your life wondering what might have been? I love wrestling my whole life pretty much and uh, it was my life on Do you feel like you've achieved your dream or you feel yes. you always want more. Nobody's ever happy. Do you feel like less of a failure? By never having tried. I always took pride in my work, and I think you have too, so. And that's enough. That's I, I, what else can there be? You can only do what they allow you to do. You can look in the mirror and say, I did everything I could. If everybody else did or didn't, that's not on you. You know, you have no power over that. So you have, you have nothing to be ashamed of. Yeah. I'm proud of you. I'm sure your mom and dad are proud of you. Most people simply do this. It clapped yeah. Right. Really, you did something. Why you didn't make it this business is beyond me. You and me and the other guys that we know, they chased their dream. We weren't afraid to do it. We took our chance, we rolled our dice, and we got what we got. At least most, you can't say you weren't talented enough, you know what I mean? Do you, I mean, do you see that? So, some other guys right now uh, may have trumped, uh, may have tr trumped this chapter, and, and some guys are making some money and probably. You know, obviously aren't as talented or haven't worked as hard as, as, as you or I. Now that doesn't mean that the last chapter, or the second last chapter, was going to shine. Uh, you know, who knows? There's not a reason why Nigel didn't make it. I mean, and, and I, don't, I wouldn't even want to say didn't make it because in a sense, how many guys start out in this business? Thousands and thousands. How many people grow up wanting to be professional wrestlers? More than that. And he made it to where, you know, at one point in time, he was one of the best wrestlers in the business. You can't take that away. It's why he didn't make it bigger. The answer is just bad luck.
It's not having to do with skills, not having to do with any deficiencies. You know, if he was luckier, who knows where he would be? Probably somewhere pretty big. Was my dream a failure? I don't think there's a discussion. I didn't achieve what I dreamt of as a kid. But was the experience I got instead not worth it? Totally. But what about that 14-year-old? What would he think of our dream? I saw you at ROH against Danielson. Like, I was about 14 as well. Oh, wow. And I just thought, um, I really want to be a pro wrestler too. I've just started training about eight. I think he'd be okay with it. But more so, he'll see our dream how I see our dream. If I'm okay with it, so will he be. I never had an obligation to make it. The only obligation I had was to try. And once I'd let go, something happened. I used some of the footage to make a trailer and put it on kickstarter.com, a platform for people to get financial support for art projects. It's been about two months now since I finished the tour. I have over 60 hours of footage, but without your help and support, I simply cannot make the documentary. I took what footage I could and I've done my best uh, with the limited resources that I had, borrowing computers. Um, there we go. Project is launched. Exciting. I uh, got up this morning and I saw that there was about 500 bucks already being pledged and I was like, holy shit, this is going to be huge. By about 3 o'clock in the afternoon, it was already nearly 10 grand. And now, by tonight, like 15 fucking grand, I can't fucking believe it. If people care this much, how can my career have been a failure? I am genuinely humbled by the show's support so far. If I had any questions about my place in professional wrestling, you've answered them. And it's not about the money, it's about the fact that you believe in me and you care about my story. When I first started this project, I had no idea if it would get funding at all, let alone in a little over a month. And yet here we are after only three days and already we, we have reached the goal. I am so amazed and moved and genuinely humbled by the show of support so far knowing that for some of you who could only afford only a few dollars that you still gave it to me when i started my retirement tour i kind of felt perhaps that my dream was a failure and that all was lost with wrestling and now i know it's never lost and somehow i feel as though Everything in my career led to this moment. Life, then, is defined by both the moments in our life and how we react to them. It's just easier to control the second part. With the money from Kickstarter, I took the next stage of my life's journey to Los Angeles, California to make the documentary that you're currently watching. 38 hours, 55 minutes. Finally on the open road. Blue skies, sunshine, clear road ahead of me. For each of us eventually, whether we're ready or not, someday it will come to an end. There'll be no more sunrises, no more minutes, hours or days. All the things you collected, whether treasured or forgotten, will pass to someone else. Your wealth, fame and temporal power will shrivel to irrelevance. It will not matter what you owned or what you were owed. Your grudges, resentments, frustrations and jealousies will finally disappear. So too your hopes, ambitions, plans and to-do lists will expire. The wins and losses that once seemed so important will fade away. It won't matter where you came from or what side of the tracks you lived at the end. It won't matter whether you were beautiful or brilliant. Even your gender and skin colour will be irrelevant. 
So what will matter? How will the value of your days be measured? What will matter is not what you bought, but what you built. Not what you got, but what you gave. What will matter is not your success, but your significance. What will matter is not what you learned, but what you taught. What will matter is every act of integrity, compassion, courage or sacrifice that enriched, empowered or encouraged others to emulate your example. What will matter is not your competence, but your character. What will matter is not how many people you knew, but how many will feel a lasting loss when you're gone. What will matter is not your memories, but the memories of those who loved you. What will matter is how long you'll be remembered, by whom and for what. Living a life that matters doesn't happen by accident. It's not a matter of circumstance, but of choice. The only choice you have is the choice to live a life that matters. Los Angeles, California. I am finally here. I'm excited to see where it goes. Other people I knew who were lost pursuing the same dream as me. And with my full drum, bring out the coffin, let the mourners come, let aeroplanes circle, moaning overhead, scribbling on the sky. The message he is dead Put cripples round the white necks of the public doves Let the traffic policemen wear black cotton gloves You are my north, my south, my east and west Sunday rest My noon My midnight My talk My song I thought love would last forever I was wrong The stars are not wanted now 